the data be available is next year when we are done each and everything. Uh, probably to complement what Madam um, Professor has said and Professor Wangwe about the pressure. Of course, if you look at the Mexico, if we heard very well when the professor was presenting, in Mexico, the president of Mexico is on top of MP, national MPI, which I think is very good. We need to do it here in Tanzania <laughs> because we will love and we will convince our excellence president to be on top of MPI, to put people into tasks, to put this member of parliament into tasks, not to point fingers all the time to the government. They should also think about sitting down and work. Because uh, when they go for the election, they pretend they are doing each and everything. But when you will present in these numbers to their constitution at the constituency level, I remember Professor Wangwe when we when we did the poverty mapping at the constituency level using 2015 HDR, I think. When you presented these numbers to the parliament, oh it was a hot debate. Those members of parliament they were crying. Eh, Mr. Speaker, see my constituency is not performing, so I need additional funds and blah, blah. So it is really a good thing, and uh, we will convince our excellence president to be on top of the MPI, to put people into tasks. Thank you. Yeah, um, I, I want to highlight two points. The importance of remittance in relation to um, influencing regional uh, development emphasis. Uh, remittance is associated with migration, whether it is global or regional or district. Um, the inflow of young, educated um, individuals from the rural to the urban could be a blessing to the receiver and a loss to the one who is losing it. But it could be also the reverse. If there are no jobs in the other place and the people move on to the next station, and generate an income and send back, it is also uh, important. That's why we see, uh, or in the UN we say, free movement of people is essential for the development of the world, whether it is at district or country level. And on the MPI in relation to political performance, the so-called political statistics is the most important issue that most of the time governments use to either suppress or appreciate their, their issues. We have seen a number of uh, human development reports who show lower indices for countries being blamed on the institution who produce them, usually UNDP, because the politicians wouldn't like to see that they will lose the next election, those who, who are worried about their post. And we have seen also a positive uh, interest in the human development report. What matters is the amount of understanding and the way they interpret it. Figures are facts, but polit the political bodies would like to do on their advantage. And that's the reason what, why we say these reports are policy-related reports. They are not simple reports that can be shelved here and there because they have important indicators in that. Thank you. So thank you very much. We have now come towards the end of our first panel. Thank you, Professor Mark, Professor Sabina, and Mr. Abraha, and Dr. Chua for very good insights. And thank you all for listening. Asante San. A round of applause. For, thank you very much. We are now going into the second session. Uh, I need to beg your indulgence, please. We are running about uh, 29 minutes and 60 seconds behind schedule. So if I can have the next panel session here. Uh, True, please, you're the moderator. If I can have uh, Professor Joseph Stiglitz, Professor Ben Ndulu, former governor of the Bank of Tanzania, Ms. Bella Bird, World Bank Country Director, and Mr. Sostena Skewe, the CEO of FSDT. So if you can sit in the middle. Do you want to sit on the end? Or you prefer that? Okay, fine. And, uh, 
uh, as they are sitting, uh, there was a man who walked into the doctor's office and the doctor looks at him and says, Hello, did you come to see me about an eye problem? He said, patient, he says, Yo, yes, how, could, how did you tell? Oh yes, you came in through the window instead of the door. <laughs> So we all here, everybody has a microphone. This is yours. Uh, one last, if someone forgot their glasses, they are brought to me, I don't want to forget. So if you are missing your spect, this is a nice Ray-Bans. Ray uh, no, I don't know, but if you're missing them, come and see me, I'll get them to you. Okay, so welcome to this uh, last session uh, of the conference. Um, We'll try to keep the energy up. Uh, what we want to try to do now is to um, be quite Tanzania specific, be forward looking and to provide inputs to the DAR statement. So we have already here some indications that we will be asking the panels for inputs to the DAR statement at the end. So you can start to have that in your mind already now. Uh, my name is True Shadvin. Uh, I work as lead economist at the uh, Embassy of Sweden here in Dar es Salaam. I also had the privilege of hosting uh, Professor Stiglitz, uh, Professor Basu, Professor Arkaya, Professor Tarp, and all of the other economists that were part of the Stockholm Statement when they were in Stockholm in September 2016. Um, so that's how we know each other. Um, Yes, so let me introduce the, the, the panel. Uh, Bella Bird, uh, you're the country director for the World Bank uh, here in Tanzania, but you also cover Somalia, Malawi, uh, let's see if I get all the countries, uh, Burundi, yeah, and earlier you were the country director for uh, still Somalia, uh, Sudan and South Sudan, uh, based in Nairobi. Uh, you worked for DFID, uh, and heading their offices in Vietnam and uh, Nepal. Uh, and before that, I understand you were also um, an advisor on uh, poverty reduction and uh, governance issues, yeah? Uh, Professor Stieglitz, I'm very happy that you're already introduced uh, <laughs> because your CV is, of course, very long and very impressive. But they were, they were uh, so I would not do that because it's already done. And we, we know that you are the Nobel laureate. Um, but I, when I looked at, uh, you know, through all your bios and CVs, there were three things that kind of struck me. There was the, the, that new came back all the time, kind of questioning the prevailing thinking and thinking in a new way. Um, another thing was dialogue, emphasizing dialogue, working on facilitating dialogue. Um, and another thing was reality. Uh, you know, checking back on reality, what's actually happening in relation to the theory. So I was thinking we could have those three with us. Uh, so new dialogue and reality, and what that would mean uh, for a DAR statement and, and in a forward-looking uh, perspective. Uh, Professor Ben Undulu, uh, I think you are very well known to this audience. Uh, you're the former governor of the Bank of Tanzania. You just retired. Uh, just a couple of months ago. Uh, you're with the university in Dar es Salaam now. Um, you have worked at the World Bank uh, as a lead economist, uh, and we have studied at the same university in Sweden, University of Lund. <laughs> um, and then last year you edited a book together with Paul Collier on Tanzania, The Path to Prosperity which has, of course, several chapters that has a lot of uh, relevance to this discussion. Um, then I'm very happy to introduce also uh, Mr. Sos uh, Kerke, who is the Executive Director of Financial Sector Deepening Trust. Uh, you have earlier worked also in the banking sector uh, and with um, approaches of uh, making markets work for the poor. 
uh, Dr. Mpangu uh, had to excuse himself, he's in the program, and uh, Mr. Mufuruki is also in the program, and unfortunately he uh, was not able to be with us. Um, so if we go on, we, we're quite late with time and everything. So what we want to try to do now is to try uh, to find some key issues and priorities for uh, a DAR statement and to be a bit more kind of Tanzania specific um, and to apply a bit of uh, radical thinking. If in the, we've had a lot of presentations and we've had discussions which have been, I think, extremely interesting and that's what I've also heard from the kind of coffee break and the lunch break. But we've been on the systems and the structures and kind of, uh, you know, the, the, the overall issues, which are very important. But when we talk about inclusive uh, development, uh, there are people that need to be included. Uh, so I thought that we could start with kind of reminding ourselves of who those people are. Uh, in Tanzania, who is it that is left behind? Who lives in poverty and, and what are their conditions? So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll give that question to Mr. Soss. You do the, the FinScope survey, so I know you have some, some insights into this. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity, and I would like also to uh, extend my appreciation to the Embassy of Sweden and ESRF for the opportunity, and this is really uh, impressive for the future of our country. Um, as I begin to uh, answer the question or try to unpack who is left behind, I'm also excited with the fact that um, the key theme here is about equitable growth and then human development. And there are a lot of assumptions one can make about equity, just like you would in terms of growth, and therefore link those to human development. So this assumes we have a very good understanding of these pathways of various mechanisms that um, economic growth, equitable growth, can lead to human development. And I think that's where economic theory comes in. And as we come from the f uh, finance part of things, um, you know, the function of, of, of a financial system through intermediation it also comes to the equation. The efficiency and effectiveness of that can also help to unpack this understanding. So back to the question. So I think, yes, human development is about humans, it's about people, it's about me, it's about you, it's about that woman in the village, it's about that young person in the streets right now. And as we talk about um, human development, I'm also thinking about you know, the gender, the women that we have also heard from this morning. And just to understand um, a little bit more about who is left behind, we have heard already about you know, poverty levels, you know, using MPIs or any other measure. And this means a lot to us because any effort in really bringing this change is not only eradicating poverty, it's also creating wealth, is bringing this freedom to the people, including ourselves. And therefore, who, who defines you know, that kind of human development? Is it from the policymaker or from my own perspective? And we have also heard about the voices that we need to really um, uh, embrace do we give enough voice to those people who want really to define their own destiny? And how are we taking into consideration uh, their voices in our development agenda? Let me use um, a FinScope um, study, um, which is a Tanzanian FinScope um, uh, uh, on financial inclusion. So we look at you know, who is participating in a financial system and how do they look like. So what I'm going to talk more about is the profile of who is left behind. So number one, the country has made uh, quite significant progress in terms of financial inclusion, just availing opportunities for people to use financial services. We still have um, a level of exclusion at around 28% of the adult population. And when you look at these, you know, you profile these people who are left behind from that perspective, you learn a lot. We realize these are not educated people, so the level of education uh, is quite an, a critical matter. We look at those and realize that their means of generating revenue to meet their living expenses is largely agricultural, although it is changing over the years to also mean enterprises and other you know, uh, casual labor. We also learn you know, quite greatly that majority of these are young people. 
So when you talk about the um, human development and if we project the future, for example, which will be coming later, we have to imagine, you know, when these young people are not getting opportunities today, they are left behind, what does it mean to their future livelihood? Much as we use those indicators, living standards, you know, health, education, um, and, and how that should be used to equip themselves. Then we look at the women. Uh, these are largely also excluded. And we also understand from the household settings in our society, um, women, you know, do a lot more uh, to, uh, to support their families. But these are also uh, excluded from a financial system, which could be regarded as a way of providing them with an opportunity so that financial services can actually manage, help them manage shocks, or build some capacities to earn more today and also in the future. But crucially, invest in their children so that they can also, you know, equally uh, uh, be active participants in the economy. And we also understand that there are people who are, um, um, again, uh, dependents. They don't have a, a means of livelihood, not necessarily because they are young, but they are ca incapable of actually generating revenue. So these are dependents, and therefore, the level of dependence in this case, you know, means a lot with the ability of the economy to be able to absorb and provide them with um, quality life. So when we look at this, um, we characterize this um, uh, uh, exclusion, then we can add more. So what does, you know, what does it mean for someone not to be educated? So FinScope tells us that you know, around 16% of the adult population has not seen the four walls of their class, meaning they have not gone to school. But to just characterize that, um, this issue is uh, more critical because even those that have at least um, you know, gone to standard seven or, or secondary school, we're not talking about the quality of education. And so what it means to that quality of education? Is it something that you know, helps this individual to manage his or her own life? Or you know, makes me competitive in the marketplace? And more broadly, if you know, I want to become a global citizen, then maybe that's another hope. So when we talk about capability, um, it's so important. And therefore, this links me to another critical issue when I'm so concerned about those that are excluded. So I believe that you know, for someone to benefit from the human development perspective, you know, there are four main tenets. One, existence of opportunities. And number two, if they are informed about those opportunities. Number three, for me, is the capability to turn those in opportunities into benefits, which means, means something to them, to the household, to an enterprise. And maybe the fourth one, which differentiates everybody, I know in the eight principles, the mindset is coming. It's from the policy-making perspective. I think it's at the it starts with an individual. And therefore, the motivation for someone doing something that would benefit him or her is so important. And we don't pay attention to the motivations people have, which links, for me, links a lot to the voices that are needed from the eight principles. So as we think about the future of this country, uh, as we think about the human development, given those indicators, whatever the approach we use, I think it's also critical to understand that we have a challenge that many are excluded in this sphere right now. Thank you very much. Um, so we have now in front of us a kind of a picture of uh, uh, women, youth, uh, characterized by low education, active in agriculture, uh, with high dependency ratios. Uh, if we then look at their you know, opportunities, so opportunities for employment, uh, there's been quite a lot of discussions during the morning on kind of uh, uh, structural transformation patterns changing uh, in a way. So technology uh, uh, changing the conditions for the different sectors, changing the conditions in the manufacturing sector, we talked about, changing the, the conditions in the services sector, uh, make it possible to trade, changing the conditions in the agriculture sector. So uh, Professor Ndulu, you were part of the um, Pathways to Prosperity Commission on Technology and Inclusive Development. If, if we take this discussion into Tanzania, wh where do you see you know, Tanzania's opportunities in relation to these lessons that we see now from techno technology development, the different sectors, and the possibilities to create employment? Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, 
I would like first maybe just uh, to start by having a, a slightly more nuanced um, projection on the basis of the work that the commission I call direct actually is already doing so that it's not all doomed and then I'll bring it uh, actually to yeah. yeah so I think we heard and it's uh, definitely uh, the story which is um, industrialization manufacturing in particular uh, has been the escalator of taking countries to development Europe and the developed world had theirs during industrial revolution and moving forward. Um, globalization, particularly facilitated by technology in terms of uh, globalization of value chains, uh, that helped uh, to move uh, industries actually to East Asia uh, in search of low skilled labor. We were hoping to be the next because we have relatively lower uh, wage costs uh, that uh, it would also serve us the same purpose. Um, we did here, not only because of the productivity growth in industry which was faster than the economy and therefore you expect uh, deindustrialization over the longer term, but it has been accelerated by new technologies uh, under the fourth industrial revolution. Now, the nuance uh, is threefold. One um, is actually automation of activities and not necessarily of whole industries. Um, and in fact, uh, we're just reviewing some work which shows, depending on who you talk to, um, the activities that are subject to automation and robotics range from the high number of 70% to the low number of 7%, depending on who uh, actually is looking at the data and how far you have disaggregated. This says there are still opportunities of being selective in terms of your industrial uh, strategy. Um, there will be activities, uh, for example, people have uh, singled out apparel, uh, which is making of clothes, which may not be as uh, because of taste involved, uh, which may not be as um, automated as one would have uh, expected. And there is a study now which goes across uh, you know, a whole range of different types of uh, uh, manufacturing activities and it shows which ones uh, still stand a chance. Second, uh, I think nuance is um, uh, this is happening, but it's not happening immediately. Uh, depending on who you are talking to, there is a window of between 10 and 20 years uh, before robotics gets really to the intensive stage. So Ethiopia fortunately has already gone into this. Uh, maybe within the life cycle of 20 years they may recoup all their investment, uh, but there are still opportunities for labor intensive um, um, manufacturing, uh, you know, uh, to be used as a way of creating not just incomes but also uh, jobs. Now, when I come to the perspective of uh, Tanzania, I think uh, uh, my take uh, is as follows. We need to be selective in terms of what industries that uh, uh, we would like actually to bring on board. One is natural resource-based industries for which we have comparative advantage and particularly those whose processes are weight losing, which means processing typically would take place at the place 
uh, of raw materials. Uh, and uh, spatial economics is very clear about where you locate what type of uh, activities. Uh, but even if uh, you go into some of these other uh, manufacturings which are uh, more automated, uh, we have to select those that have linkages with the rest of the economy. So we shouldn't be talking only about the direct employment effect of uh, industries, but also the indirect uh, uh, effects. And once you start looking at that, um, a good bit of, um, if you want, um, uh, agro-industries, agro-processing, um, have huge links uh, to the sector that ultimately uh, employs the majority of uh, uh, Tanzanians. Um, and if you actually consider the cases, successful cases of Chile, successful cases of Malaysia, who have gone on agro-processing and high-value uh, agro-industry, uh, it is uh, definitely the case that they have been able to make good progress. Even with minerals, you know, it's... Uh, Provided we have enough energy uh, to do some of the smelting um, and add value to uh, minerals, uh, some of those processes can actually be, again, domesticated. Um, and the, the big question there is um, we have cases. Norway uh, is a resource-rich country that has gone up the escalator. Uh, Australia... Uh, likewise, it's uh, a natural resource-based uh, economy. So is Canada. Um, you know, uh, Dutch disease or resource case is not a destiny. It can be fixed, provided you have the right institutions. And as we heard today, when you do proper contracting and related, it can actually be a good way to do it. So these are all opportunities which we as Tanzanians, I think, have partly because of our natural resource wealth. I'm answering partly uh, uh, the question that the minister put forward uh, in terms of where actually we go from here. Finally, is creation of value chains within the country, making sure that agriculture gets uh, more value, uh, and it's not a question of transport only. It's a question of logistics, being able to organize where things move. It's a question of value chains that are regional in the sense of beyond Tanzania, but within Africa and making it uh, uh, more connected. That's where we have succeeded most in terms of exports of manufacturers as a country. And that way, we also learn to compete. If you want is, uh, the practice before you break uh, into the global uh, value chains itself. Yeah. If, if, uh, thank you very much. Uh, if I can just follow up, you said on the, the importance of the linkages uh, and the value chains, and then you mentioned uh, uh, logistics and transport. Because I, I, I think it was mentioned uh, kind of two times maybe this morning, but not that many times, the services sector mm -hmm. and the role of the services sector in this. If you could just, not very long, yeah. very short, you know, yeah. what, is the, what do you, role do you see for the services sector in this multi-pronge uh, approach that we are now aiming for? Yeah, um, I think, as you know, um, services sector accounts for about 54% of GDP in terms of contribution. So it is big. I think the big drivers will be um, tourism, uh, which exploits the, the natural uh, resource endowments we have in, in relation to uh, uh, wildlife and, and related. It also happens to be a major foreign exchange earner. Right? And just being able to meet the requirements of education and health, 
we are so far away from the frontier that there is a lot still that needs to be done. And that's part of the services um, uh, sector that is ultimately also going to be, I think, a major contributor. Thank you very much. Um, so actually, I should have said that from the beginning. Uh, we're introducing a bit of different themes in the questions to the panelists, and then you're welcome to comment on each other. So I'm, I'm seeing you you're making notes here. So, But I'll, I'll, I'll still have two questions to ask to uh, Professor Stiglitz and, uh, and uh, Bella. Um, Professor Stiglitz, we, we, we talked quite a lot about uh, trade and globalization uh, in the morning, and uh, you were also quite specific on what is needed. You need to ensure competition. You need to be uh, very uh, neat in your negotiation on your contract. Uh, um, you need to be sure to retain the, the revenues in the country, etc. I just wanted if you if you could elaborate a little bit more on the inclusiveness. So how do we because you could have a good negotiation, you could have, you know, revenues coming to the country, but how do you ensure that you have uh, a trade policy and and an approach to globalization and to your natural resources that protects the workers and that ensures an inclusive uh development following on that? Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let me say there there are two aspects of that. Uh, in, in a way, uh, globalization is like uh, a discovery of a new technology that uh, increases your opportunity set. What you can do. So, in principle, it can make the the country richer, and uh, everybody could be better off. But the market equilibrium, where the market winds up could make significant fractions of the population worse off. So first, there has to be some way of ensuring that everyone is actually better off. And that includes active labor market policies, social protection, uh, uh, a whole gamut of ways to make sure that the fruits of the growth are shared among all the citizens. Uh, uh, and uh, we didn't get a chance to talk about the, uh, this as much this morning, but uh, yesterday we, we visited some of the uh, programs of, of um, uh, targeting money to the poorest. And uh, one of the things that was coming out in the early data that was being discussed was that uh, giving money to these very poor people in that way, which is part of the, if you have a good tax system of collecting, uh, is that it actually increases their productivity. So it is not only a, a mechanism of, of increasing inclusiveness, it's also increasing uh, economic growth. Uh, but the second one is really uh, following up on what Benno said, is to think a little bit about uh, managing globalization uh, from the perspective of sectoral uh, growth. What parts of the economy are going to uh, uh, be helped to participate, engage in uh, uh, globalization? And, uh, uh, so that, for instance, uh, he talked about uh, the potential uh, on the one hand of, of uh, tourism as a service sector that uh, takes uh, advantage of some of the natural resources, but at the same time uh, has linkages, uh, if it's done right, to many other parts of the economy and, and provides jobs for a whole range of skills uh, within within the uh, e economy, so so the bottom line to keep uh, is is that the problem isn't with globalization itself; it's uh, the way we manage globalization, and if we manage it right, uh, it can uh, be a benefit to uh, it can lead to inclusive growth, and it can be a benefit to most citizens in the country, but obviously. There have been many instances when it has not been managed right. Thank you very much. So, active labor market policy, social protection, key 
key complementary issues. Exactly. Yeah, or measures. Yeah. And I, I would say more broadly, you, you know, ex shaping industrial policies. We had a brief discussion this morning on industrial policies. Uh, the government does intervene in one way or another uh, in a variety of ways in uh, helping uh, one industry versus another, and one has to think very carefully, is it through availability of credit or through explicit subsidies? Uh, um, the question is, uh, uh, there are some sectors that can be helped uh, to make them more competitive uh, and to engage in globalization uh, more effectively with stronger linkages to the rest of the economy. And so that was one of the things that Benno emphasized, the importance of, the, of these linkages. One aspect of those linkages that I would add is, uh, you might say, the more dynamic, uh, the more learning aspects of those linkages. Uh, one of the reasons that natural resource uh, economies in general haven't done very well is uh, countries have not developed those linkages and when they have, they haven't used them in a dynamic way. So they haven't used them, you know, one of the things about manufacturing, why it was so successful in, in contributing to economic growth was that if a country, uh, you know, if Korea was going to compete globally in manufacturing, it had to learn a lot. It really had to learn, it had to go up uh, the technology scale very quickly. Uh, it, it, it's not that easy to make ships, or it's not that easy to make television sex, and, and it succeeded in going up to the point where all of us uh, use, for instance, Samsung telephones, which are really at the forefront uh, uh, of research. Well, uh, from the very beginning, they recognized uh, that these linkages, and particularly these learning linkages, uh, were critical. Well. What uh, we've both been saying is that manufacturing can't have the central role that it had in East Asia, but can have a, 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 a role. But the other parts of engaging in globalization, whether it's the service sector uh, or agriculture, uh, those too can have uh, a lot of dynamic aspects. If we think about those dynamic aspects, you know, it's not necessary. You, know, you talk about agriculture, you often think about primitive agriculture, subsistence agriculture, but that's not modern agriculture. Modern agriculture is actually uh, enormously efficient and, and very technological. Thank you. Um, we move on to a bit more focus on uh, human development. Um, it's been mentioned, of course, uh, during the day, uh, and we just heard it now also from uh, SOS, uh, the education levels, and we heard earlier the uh, finance minister mentioning the, the skills gap. Uh, the five-year development plan uh, is quite clear on the ambition to link economic development and human development. So how do you, uh, how do you see that nexus in, 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 in Tanzania and how can we accelerate uh, human development? Well, thank you very much, True. And um, I'll respond to that in a moment, but first. <laughs> <laughs> they all have their own <laughs> questions that they answer. I wanted just to, to um, follow on from what Susie said about, about who's left behind. Because I think that's quite an important thing to to be really clear on, you know, as we as we go into the discussion, and and uh, and what we've seen in in the poverty data and what's driving what the way we we uh, the analytics and the program that that we pursue in in Tanzania, is this understanding that that yes, it appears to be large families, l less education, and uh, engagement in subsistence agriculture that defines those households that stay in poverty. And, and indeed, families or households that are moving out of poverty, we've seen some indication of, of, the, of the cash transfers uh, playing a role, as well as ability to move into non-farm business and, um, and also mobile money playing a huge role. So just, I just wanted to, to sort of put that out. But also, when we say left behind, left behind in what way? Because I think the, the, the panel earlier gave that fantastic data on the spatial uh, 
uh, disparities in, in Tanzania. And I think you see that very clearly in the poverty data where poverty in Dar es Salaam has, has fallen dramatically, uh, whereas poverty elsewhere in the country, you know, maybe a 15% 15 reduction in rural areas, where it's a 70% reduction in, in Dar es Salaam. And you see very little movement in the secondary cities. You also see that same disparity when it comes to services, water, sanitation, energy. It's all, the rural areas are dramatically below um, the, the urban areas. And I think there's a, there's a new um, a group which is increasing in terms of those left behind. And I was looking at some data just recently on adolescent mothers in Tanzania. And you see in the, in the poorest quintile, there's, there's been an increase over the last five years of 50% in the number of adolescent pregnancies in, in the poorest quintile. I hope that data's right. My team gave it to me, so team. Please, uh, please uh, stand up if I got it wrong. But, but that, that I think we, is, we're also seeing being seen reflected in some of the public discourse here, and and we know that that you know poor single mothers in the poorest quintile will not be able to look after their children in a way that that helps to break the intergenerational cycle. So I think that's I just wanted to put those those out there as well. Now, very quickly on on the nexus between economic and human development, I've. I've said before in public, and I'll say it again, and it's there in the new World Bank strategy very clearly, that I think, I, I think that certainly one of, if not the primary constraint to Tanzania in reaching its middle-income country status lies in, in human, the human capital indicators. And, and I think when you look at, uh, I just wanted to highlight a few, um, and, and the World Bank's coming out with uh, human capital index this year. I think this is the year of multi-dimensional <laughs> indexes. But, um, and I think we're, we're going to see, you, you'll see the human, this is all your influence, Joe, but you see how the World Bank has, has shifted. But it's, human development is so central to, to what we're doing. And, and, and the, the growth, the, the linkages between human capital, capability of a country and growth potential are becoming clearer and clearer. And, and I just wanted to highlight a few issues in relation to Tanzania. One is uh, chronic undernutrition. Tanzania has some of the, the most concerning numbers in the world. A third of children under five are chronically undernourished. And there's, there's data, and if anyone hasn't read the book, The First Thousand Days, I recommend you put it at the top of your, of your reading list. It, it demonstrates so clearly that if, if there is if there are, are, are deficits in nutrition in, and in stimulation, in psychosocial uh, support in the first thousand days from the time of conception to two years, it will have a devastating impact on that individual for the rest of their life. And that means that a third of the workforce will, will, be, will, will not be in a position to able to be cognitively engaged, particularly as the as the, the economy becomes more sophisticated. Um, so it's it's really something that, that is so critical. And I know that the leadership in the government in Tanzania are very gripped with this. And and uh, it's great to be working with them on, on, uh, on a plan to address that. And I could talk specifically about that perhaps later. The second one is on the quality of education. Um, we did service delivery indicators on Tanzania and which demonstrated not just in education but in health as well that that the quality is still very poor relative to comparators that needs to change and it is changing there's some great results based work in the education and we're starting to see progress but but it it really needs uh, prioritization and i think this government has really done great work in in putting consistent finance into the education sector, which is really starting to make a difference. And then third, the third point I'd, I'd raise is, is just on, on skills and the level of skills in the population. We did a recent skills report which showed, and it was the headline in the newspapers, um, and, and some, some disbelief, I think, but over 80% of, of Tanzanians are in the low-skilled category and only 3% in the higher-skilled category. That needs to change, and if and if uh, if if you're striving to to hit mixed status, and you look at the average of high skilled for middle income countries, it's much closer to 10%. And so, so I'd say that that I would just want to highlight those those three points on the human development side as a starter. Thanks. 
Thank you very much. Um, we don't have that much time. Um, so, and we have had quite, uh, quite a lot of interaction uh, from the audience. So I now rather open up within, ooh, within the panel if you want to comment or, or uh, on each other's uh, uh, interventions or ask questions uh, to each other. So I give you in the panel a first chance to, to uh, make further um, interventions. Well, let me, let me begin by uh, just saying uh, I'm, I'm a little bit less optimistic than Benno is uh, on, uh, you know, he, he emphasized uh, things are not going to happen immediately uh, and uh, uh, that not everything is going to be uh, robotized, uh, at least uh, quickly. And I agree with that. Uh, so the question is, is a judgment call between uh, the, the lower limits of how fast and, and, the, and the, uh, the upper limits and, and the challenge that that uh, presents to Tanzania. And at least uh, I think that there are uh, some reasons to believe uh, that uh, it will happen uh, more rapidly than uh, um, the optimist uh, claim, and, and that's partly because uh, even within the last uh, few years, the advances in AI and artificial intelligence have uh, really exceeded what people had thought was were going to happen. You know, the, the example that's always given is that computers now can beat the best human in Go, and that's a game in which the number of moves uh, that are possible is greater than the number of atoms in the universe. So that it's not like chess, that is a really easy game uh, that uh, a bright computer, you know, a big computer can, can solve the optimal strategy. In the Go, there isn't a, an ability to do it. It's based on learning. Um, and so uh, in a, a lot of processes, uh, the, the new technologies will be able to learn uh, in a wide range of areas uh, as quickly uh, as humans. The reason why I say that is it means uh, it has implications for all countries, you know, uh, developing and, and developed countries, because it means uh, that manufacturing, you know, if, if uh, robots are more efficient uh, than humans, uh, it, the wage levels won't make a big deal of difference. Uh, and so one of the competitive advantages that East Asia had was that wages were low. But if you know machines uh, don't need the kind of nurture that labor forces uh, need, uh, and and uh, uh, although that reminds us of, of a famous uh, uh, joke uh, about uh, um, one of the uh, the president uh, head of uh, GM or one of the. Uh, major automobile uh, companies looking down at a, manu a floor with the head of the union saying, uh, look at all those robots, uh, they, they uh, won't belong to your union. And uh, the head of the union said, uh, yes, but they won't be buying your cars either. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that, that reminds us there, there has to be a balance if, if, if there's going to be, uh, it's a challenge to both developed and developing countries. But it's why I've emphasized uh, so much that you can't put all your eggs in the basket of manufacturing. But the other thing that Benno emphasized uh, really fits in uh, with, with what Bella said, that uh, there's a huge demand for, a need for human development uh, in terms of education, health, um, the, the importance of the first thousand days, uh, uh, Though robots can't do that care in that first thousand days, at least yet. And uh, there, you're absolutely right, it won't happen quickly. So those are industries, uh, and in an aging society, um, you have to care for the aged, too. Uh, we, let's not just forget the first thousand days. Uh, we think about the last thousand days as well. Uh, they, uh, so the point is that those are all very labor-intensive services. Some of them uh, reasonably skilled, 
And so you can use your skilled labor force. Uh, you both train it and use it at the same time. So we seem to have agreed that we need a multi-pronged uh, approach, but the balance uh, we seem to have a bit of uh, different views uh, on. But, uh, but at least that we need to have a look at all the sectors and see how they, how they relate to each other and, uh, and uh, look at it more holistically. Um, I saw Mr. Soss uh, wanting to... Yes, and now so I'm, I'm asking for short interventions, yeah. and then we will move into the last part of the, of the panel, which is that uh, um, uh, to identify two key issues that you want to bring in to a DAR uh, statement. And I will also ask you to write them down uh, on uh, post-its. Uh, so I'll come back to that, but please. Thank you. I just want to link to the issue of uh, markets, um, state and community. And this is more to um, Professor Joseph. So you emphasized a lot about um, the need for dialogue. And, you know, in, in, in the process to, you know, equip the country um, in the economic path, you know, the access to markets so critical, both local or foreign, or preferred markets for that matter. So when you emphasize the issue of dialogue, you know, what exactly do you mean? You know, and I'm putting some words in your mouth right now. Do you think, you know, economic diplomacy, you know, matters a lot? And if so, in what sense? When I talk about dialogue, there, there are many aspects of this. For instance, uh, one aspect that we talked about a little bit this morning was uh, uh, the voices of the poor. The question uh, that uh, True asked you, you know, who are the poor? And the other part of it, what is, uh, what is it that is affecting their lives? What are the barriers? Uh, and I think it, it, that's a question where uh, dialogue, the, the, what makes a difference may differ very much geographically, and I think that was brought out uh, very clearly in, in the previous panel. So, uh, and that's where generalizations, you know, say one size fits all policy doesn't work. Not only is that true across countries, it's also true uh, within, uh, within countries. Uh, but there's another aspect of dialogue uh, that is, uh, it's important uh, to create a national understanding or a local understanding uh, about uh, the development process itself. Uh, that uh, if development is going to be successful, it has to entail the engagement of uh, everybody. We talked this morning, it's a societal transformation, a change in mindsets. Uh, you can't order somebody to think differently uh, it, uh, that change in mindset only comes through a change in understanding, and that change in understanding comes through interchange, what has worked in some countries, what hasn't in others. And uh, the whole, you know, watching the development dialogue uh, at the international level over the last 30 years, I think that dialogue has resulted in, in different understandings uh, of what creates uh, development. And the fact that the world is changing means that uh, it wasn't just that we got it wrong uh, 30 years ago. It's also, even if we had gotten it right, what we got right then wouldn't be right for now. So uh, that process, I think, is, is really very critical in, uh, in the development process because the development process itself is, is so critically a change in mindset. We talked to before about the importance of, of uh, demography, the, the, uh, demogra the, the fertility rates. Um, you can't order, I think, in a, a democratic society, people uh, to behave in a different way, but you can persuade them by making them understand broadly the consequences, the full consequences of their actions and exposing them to uh, other ways that in which people uh, are living. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we're running out of time, and uh, I think we are we are approaching five o'clock, um, and we still have a, a summary to to make uh, of the day. Um, 
So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking I'm, we, we're going to go to the last part of the session. Um, so I'll ask you to try to come with two kind of key uh, issues, key uh, inputs uh, to a DAR statement from today's discussion. Uh, and we've, you know, we've talked about it being Tanzania specific, but also, you know, relating to, to similar uh, countries. So, and if you can also write it down so we can get it up. I'm sure all of you here have been to workshops and you know the, the power of post-its, you know. When you get something on a post-it, it feels like you've really accomplished something at a meeting. So, uh, I can see you're already writing. Um, I'll, uh, I'll give you some time by trying to summarize a little bit. Um, I, I thank you, Bella, for bringing up again uh, the importance of keeping an eye on who, who, who is poor and in what ways they are poor. And I think that's uh, what Sabina has been emphasizing earlier during the day, when the need to look at the multidimensional poverty, um, uh, etc. And the uh, focus on human development, the multi pronged approach to structural transformation, we need to look at all the sectors, the importance of uh, complementing uh, uh, trade policies, uh, uh, participation in globalization, natural resource approach with active labor market policies and uh, social protection. Those are some of the things that I've heard throughout the day and, uh, and also uh, during this panel. I can see you. You. Yeah. Well, you can. You. 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 You'll read. Read them out, oh, and then I'll. I'll. Okay. Uh, I'll take them. Just yeah. Are you ready? Just to get get yeah. things going. Uh, the the first is uh, the problem is not with globalization itself, but how we manage it. Um, th there's a paragraph that goes after that, but but on a post that you can't uh, put that uh, on. And the second one is uh, something both Benno and I said is. Uh, uh, natural resources can be a blessing. It's not necessarily a curse, and it's not destiny. But can you put something on that post-it or what it requires for it to be oh, a blessing? No. no. Yes. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> You've said it. <laughs> yes, oh, please. Um, natural resources, I think as much as possible maximizing the local content of natural resource exploitation, but doing it in consultation with the private sector so as it doesn't become a disincentive for investment, but you, you can find the win-win situation. But I also think if, if there were some calculations done sort of five, so four or five years ago looking at uh, the, the potential fiscal benefits of the LNG uh, investments, the offshore in, in Tanzania, and, and, and there were some projections done on how the resources that could be available, for example, to sustain a social protection program the size of, of, of TASAF that could have major redistribution effects. And I think those, those kinds of ideas, it would be fantastic if they were in the statement. Okay, very good. Uh, Professor Ndulu. Well, I have... Uh I have a couple. Um, one of them is obvious because of what I'm doing now, which is harness technology for making services more accessible and affordable. And what it will take, of course, is a whole range of other things. That, huh? um, second, access to information to improve effective citizen engagement. And this goes with some of the principles there about choices. So I'll take those two, and then uh, Sosa, are you? Are you oh, I'm, I'm going to are write you them more properly. So I have the following. I think it's good to have a common understanding uh, where we are headed to 30, 50 years from now. So I would like to imagine that we need to define the impact we want to see 30 years from now. If we don't have that vision, it's difficult. So build the vision 
you know, through connected thinking and coordinating our action through the process. Then the second one is we have to make choices. We have to pick the sectors that will impact the majority. And it goes back to my who is left behind. So we have to make choices. Where do we begin, even with that long-term view? Thank you. I could see uh, Professor Stiglitz, you, you wrote another post-it. Yeah, I wrote two, uh, I wrote two, I, I wrote two <laughs> more, but, but I, I, I can't write very well. Um, so uh, one is that Tanzania needs a, a multiple approach, and we've talked about all the dimensions. So I, I, uh, and the other one is uh, something that came up this morning, uh, but hasn't been talked in this last group, is that measurement matters. And that, uh, again, in terms of the, the multidimensional poverty measure, uh, that uh, if you measure the wrong thing, you can get misdirected. So uh, the concern, say, in poverty here was uh, they were investing in education and health, but weren't, were measuring only the returns in terms of money, monetary poverty. And uh, if they had been using a multi-dimensional approach, they would have shown more progress that was being made. Thanks, Bella. You have written something more there. Mm. Um, my other points would be as follows, and I'm, I'm afraid I'm not, uh, I'm not being disciplined in keeping to two. But... Um, yeah, exactly. I'm just following Joe's lead. <laughs> um, I think the point of voice is really, is really key, and I think it's come out really nicely today. The, the listening to people, the engagement. I really like the idea in the last panel of using the MPI for, for engagement of leaders uh, at the constituency level, um, if that was possible. And I also really liked Mama Chua's point about building an evidence-based culture. And having links to your point, Joe, having, da having good data, being open with the data, using it for policy making purposes at all levels, so, so important if, if the resources and the policies are going to achieve their objectives. And then the last one I'd have, which I haven't written yet, which I'm about, about to, is, is on sustained investment in, in building human capital. And Ali Mufruki, who couldn't join us today, he, he launched a, a book last year with, with a group of colleagues in this room, I think, which, which had just the most fantastic chapter on education. Uh, and I would, we, we took, we'd, we'd take every word in, in the World Bank. It was just brilliant about how to, a 40-year plan of investment to really take education up very significantly at every level. And I think that would be, um, one of the best things Tanzania could do. Thank you very much. Do we have more or uh, are we at the end? I think these are excellent contributions. And you know, the, the thing also with post-its when you are facilitating is that you are now doing the sum summarizing of things and then putting it up here. And I don't have to do that. Um, yes. So we can do, should we do one round and then we end? Uh, yeah. Uh, we start with Professor Stiglitz, and then we go, uh, Professor. So, so this is just a, an elaboration of one of the points that was in the Stockholm Statement that uh, I think it came out. Uh, it, it, one of the points in the Stockholm Statement uh, is the balance between market stakes and the community. And one aspect of that uh, was the role of checks and balances uh, between the two and within each. And uh, within that uh, was the important role of the media as part of a, a, our system, uh, of a system of checks and balances. Thank you. And it's also part of the uh, vo ways of mechani uh, mechanisms of voice yeah. uh, that Bella was talking about. Thanks. Professor Ndulu? I think Joe has covered everything. <laughs> Sauce? So? I'm good. Um, I would like to emphasize on the need to uh, mobilize um, resources, investments. All this requires a lot of money. And it's either through fiscal mechanisms or financial intermediation. So the rethink of the role of financial system is critical. We saw already 
create private sector is quite low. We need more than that. So I would like to emphasize on the role of finance in mobilizing resources and allocating them appropriately. Um, I think with that, we thank you very much. We have uh, uh, a good basis. I mean, the discussion is continuing tomorrow uh, with the government uh, to look at uh, and, and to continue to look at the DAR statement. So I think we have excellent input from, from this panel. Um, so thank you very much. I think we should give a big hand. Thank you very much for that lovely discussion. As we now start our journey to wind down, and uh, thank you, you are. <laughs> if I, we're on the last leg now, uh, so. Uh, Oh, yes. Uh, if you can ask uh, Professor Mkenda to come up and give us the, uh, not the whole speech, <laughs> but uh, a few of your remarks, your comments, observations as we move forward towards the DA principles. And then after he finishes, I'll sort of give Karib. Uh, Asante, so. I've been warned not to give a long speech. So we have covered so many issues, and I, I, I'm sure if I try to, to repeat, I might end up distorting, and then uh, everybody will want to come and clarify what they said. So let me make a very broad, <laughs> uh, broad um, summary. I think the point of departure essentially was that you cannot leave everything to the market devices, that the market itself will sort out what you need, and somehow it will aggregate our individual aspirations into collective aspirations, and that will be able to achieve. We have always known that that is not possible. Uh, as Professor Stiglitz explained, even Adam Smith himself was very skeptical the moment you have a cup of those guys, the butcher and who, whenever they meet together, they will conspire against the public. Individually, they may save the public through their pursuit of personal interests, but, but even then, it was well known that you cannot leave everything to the market. That is clear. That is settled. Unfortunately, there was a time where the pendulum pushed us into trying to leave everything to the market. The so-called Washington consensus, or lack of it, according to, to Bella. Uh, that, um, because during the structural adjustments, it was like, just focus on efficiency, improve efficiency in the system. You know, the income will improve. There will be trickle down. Everybody will be happy and things will move. So our point of departure is that such a scenario is not feasible. And therefore, what do we do? Because the moment the market is not doing everything for you, you have to decide what you want to do. And hence, the need to define our common goals, our common aspirations. In a way, that's what Stockholm statement does try to define what us as hum human beings, as humanity, community of people, community of nations, will want to achieve. And one of the things you see in the Stockholm Statement is that GDP is but a means, not an end in itself. I think Amata Sen had a way of explaining this. Things that are are instrumentally valuable, that they are just instrument to achieve something else, and things that are intrinsically valuable, that is, the things really we aspire to achieve. So income 
is a means that will take us where we want to go. And I'm not sure it's very easy to define exactly what that end matter is, whether it's just happiness, long life, no matter what. But at least we know the means GDP is just a means. We cannot use it as summarizing everything. Because if you do that, we'll end up like that famous economist who said you can shift polluting industries to poor countries because after all, apart from the argument you put across uh, Professor Stiglitz, he also said <coughs> if people die in the poor countries where productivity is very low, then the global GDP will not suffer as much. That's because if you measure everything in terms of GDP, then you measure life in terms of, of, of income also. So the Stockholm uh, statement reminds us that we must go beyond just the income. So we need to define common aspirations, things that we want to achieve as a nation, as a community of nations, as people, as humanity. And that's not very easy, but at least there are some inspirations from the statement. And we hope we'll have restatement in Dar es Salaam of those aspirations. So we have had a number of things discussed in terms of market states and community that macroeconomic stability is essential, very important, but not the only thing. And I think something very important, and I hope my colleagues from universities who are here, the issues of technological progress and inequality. We may feel miffed that you are starting to talk about manufacturing, industrialization, and all of a sudden, you are reminded that the train might have just left. <laughs> or maybe not. Intellectuals will not run away from inconvenient facts or propositions. They will rather interrogate and look again and see whether we need to formulate our policy in a better way. Because of course the way we cast our objective for industrialization, by that we mean manufacturing uh, base, expanding our manufacturing base, is the fact that we have a, a, a very lopsided economy where about two-thirds of our labor force is rural based mostly in the agricultural sector and they contribute less than a third of the GDP. Which means about two-thirds of our labor force contributes only a third of the GDP. And therefore, we use that as an argument to undertake structural transformation so that we improve productivity in the rural area, in the agricultural sector, we release surplus labor, absorb them in the manufacturing base, and make sure that everybody is happy. It's the same argument in a way that informs the Africa Agenda 2063. In certain ways, the Sustainable Development Goals. But the risks are real. The fact that technology is moving on, these are facts that we need to interrogate and see how better to take advantage of the changes. And the fact that, not I think, the fact that maybe manufacturing is important, and that was the message. We should continue to pursue manufacturing, but if you have to pursue it in multi-pronged approach, the other sectors which are also very important, perhaps they need also to invest more heavily in technology and so on and so forth. But I think this is, in my way, from the lecture at the university, and here is something that we need to, to think uh, a lot. And other aspects of the Stockholm Statement, which I'm not going to repeat. So we also heard about issues of measurement. And I think this is quite tricky. Uh, as Professor Stigley said, we, we were struggling at some point here when we were looking at household budget survey data in 1920, 21, and 2007. And we saw the poverty headcount has gone down. In a way, we felt that the GDP was growing sufficiently fast for the poverty to have shown remarkable drop, but we didn't feel that the poverty has gone down sufficiently. And there was a debate within development partners that maybe we are work working with you, but nothing is showing because we don't see headcount is hovering around. 
you know, and then we are forced to think, going through looking at, uh, at, at, the, at the school enrollment rates, uh, looking at uh, access to health and so on, and realize that we are making tremendous progress in those areas. But when you measure income poverty, you actually don't measure income that is not spent. The, the income you collect, the information you collect from the household is the expenditure of goods and services. In a way, we did not collect, we did not try to impute values on education that has been made available to the household. So an increased consumption of education was not reflected in the household consumption. And because that was missing out, we did not see that consumption has increased sufficiently. So the need to have proper measurement, the need to be as multidimensional as we can, and unfortunately, it doesn't get any easier. Uh, because the reason normally we settle to income is because it kind of summarizes a lot of things. You miss out into a lot of things, but it's kind of a nice summary. The moment you try to include everything, then only <laughs> Professor Alkaya <laughs> can handle that. <laughs> uh, but, but measurement is important. It's an agenda that has to be active in front of us because we must try to avoid uh, what uh, Professor Stiglitz and others call mismeasurement. Uh, that we try to accurately reflect the progress that we are making or lack of it, uh, so that we rethink what to do next. So these are probably the, the key texts for me, uh, as I say. Again, one, we reaffirm that market is important, completely as essential. We must respect it, but it's not enough. It's not enough at all. There are market failures, so we need the state, we need the communities. The moment we depart from leaving everything to the market, it means we go back to the question of social welfare function. Eh? How do you define it? What do you put into it? What are you trying to maximize? So we must define our common aspirations. And then, of course, there are issues of measurement that we must continue to grab with. It doesn't get any easier, but you cannot run away from the challenge. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Mkenda, for that summary. As we close, uh, on behalf of ESRF and uh, the Embassy of Sweden, I want to thank you all for spending the whole day with us. I think you should give yourselves a hand for being here with us. You know. That's cool. um, as, we, as we leave here, the things that we have to do that, and the things that are going to be done tomorrow. And I've said this before and I'm going to say it again. It's very, very important that you listen to this very, very carefully. There were four people named everybody, somebody, anybody, and nobody. There was an important job to be done and everybody was, was asked to do it. Everybody was sure somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it, but nobody did it. Somebody got angry about that because it was everybody's job. Everybody thought anybody could do it, but nobody realized that everybody would not do it. It had ended up that everybody blamed somebody when nobody did what anybody could have done. So let's do something. And thank you very much for being here. Travel well. Have a good evening. And uh, to, for tomorrow's session, we'll see what happens and we can come up with the dark principles. Thank you once again for being with us today. Have a good evening and thank you very much.